we are live uh, for today's webinar. I'm just going to wait for less than a minute to have a few attendees join in before I get started. Okay, I think this, I can see the attendee count going up, so let's get started. Hello, everyone. I am Shweta Vandapani. I am the community builder. I'm one of the community builders on Be Waste Wise, and we hold uh, two webinars every month on very diverse topics related to waste and sustainability at large. Today, uh, we have um, we have a Professor Mansoor Ali with us, who's moderating the webinar. Uh, Mansoor Ali has moderated other webinars for us. You can head to the webinar section on our website and you will find all of them listed over there. Mansoor is going to tackle the topic uh, fruit and vegetable market waste in Africa, a climate change perspective. He is uh, talking to a pretty large panel today. We have Muzaffar Kemdin, who is head of planning, monitoring, learning and evaluation at UN World Food Program. We have uh, Veronica Dibella, who's an ESG professional. We have Amy Harrison, gender equality, disability and social inclusion specialist. Well, we, we are awaiting Harrison Quach to join us, who is also going to join us. He's a waste management consultant. We have Olaposi Fallo, who is a manager at the economic development team at Adam Smith International. Uh, we will take your questions. Please divert them to the Q&A box. Please use chat to introduce yourselves and to add any comments. And uh, yes, I'm handing this over to Mansoor because we have a very busy panel today. Thank you, Shweta. While you will be say, uh, sharing the slide, I just wanted to introduce the topic very, very briefly because we would like to hear more from the, uh, our expert panelists. So first thing is uh, we we are talking about uh, already separated streams of waste, which are predominantly organic waste. So we are not talking about uh, household mixed waste and other things. And this stream provides, uh, uh, in theory, a major potential uh, to address some of the climate challenges. Um, so it it can, uh, if you manage uh, this and apart from the technical benefits and the climate uh, measurable benefits, uh, it has also got a number of social development benefits. So on the climate side, it um, reduces methane. If you separate it, process it in a certain way, um, it reduces the waste dumping cost it reduces the, the, the transportation emissions. Uh, and also, um, if you apply, convert it into something like compost, apply it to soil, then it's useful in terms of drought because it improves the, the, the soil. So there are a number of, uh, in theory, there are a number of benefits, and that's why it has a lot of attention, including attention from our program, which is a UK uh, International Development Climate Improvement Program uh, for over uh, next two years, and uh, also some other donors working on it. Today, we will be talking uh, more findings from a project, but also we have panelists who will be talking uh, about across African region, few things which we, we will be asking them. So it, despite all these opportunities, uh, in theory, there are still a number of challenges uh, with with this and uh, especially the technology which we feel are uh, easier, the social development considerations which we always feel are easier to address. Um, in practice, they are they create number of uh, challenges and we still feel there is a lot of learning and collaboration and partnership and trust needs to be built up between all of us professionals but also among donors and go government and other players. So I, with this brief introduction, I would I, I would like to hand over to uh, Muzaffar. We will be talking about few aspects of uh, of this big topic today, uh, but we think these uh, aspects are important. So I will be handing over to to Muzaffar, and then Amy will be talking about social development, and then we will have a couple of uh, questions to our panelists. So over to you, Muzaffar, and can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Uh, next to this one. That's fine. Thank you so much, uh, Mansoor. Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues and uh, participants. So uh, I've been asked to uh, share a few key findings uh, from the work that we did in uh, in the restaurant. And I'm going to do uh, exactly that without uh, adding any uh, whistles and uh, bears and whistles. Now, um, 
one of the um, key findings uh, from the work that we did uh, in the rest of you can get a hint um, on that finding from the structure uh, of this uh, of this uh, slide. If you look on the very uh, left uh, side, you'll see that uh, we have uh, split uh, the column in three uh, or the four uh, uh, three elements. Uh, there is uh, the supply side, demand side, and uh, uh, the uh, conducive uh, enabling environment. And um, we came to the uh, realization very early in the process that if we are to uh, really meet or rather realize the success that needs to be uh, realized, we can't really treat any element of this system in isolation. Yeah, Organic waste as a sector or subsector should be treated as a system. And um, that's one of the uh, realizations that uh, we came to very early in the process. A good example is uh, you may, for example, want to focus on the supply side where you improve um, markets, uh, fruits and vegetable uh, markets waste generation. But if you don't work on the uh, demand side, you end up with more and better quality waste that goes nowhere, that no one needs. That's just uh, one, one small example. Um, the um, other uh, key finding is on the uh, opportunities uh, side. In our work, in our working in, uh, in diversity, we came to realize that uh, Waste workers who are amongst the key stakeholders in uh, organic waste management have a really good understanding of what needs to be done when it comes to uh, improving working conditions. Yeah, they may not have uh, an excellent understanding of what organic waste management entails. They may not have uh, the knowledge of specifics of what goes into excellent organic waste management or where the challenges are, but they know that their working conditions need to be improved. And this knowledge is uh, unanimous. And the reason why this is important is because by improving their working conditions, you then in turn and indirectly end up improving organic, uh, organic waste management. The other key, uh, key finding uh, in this uh, exercise, again, under the uh, opportunities, is the um, overall general willingness of our uh, stakeholders uh, in um, bringing about the needed uh, improvements. And I must specify that uh, this was uh, specifically important to see amongst public uh, officials. If you've been to Tanzania, uh, you may be thinking, Muzaffa, that is not new. Tanzanians are generally very agreeable uh, people, actually more agreeable than your average uh, person. But um, really, we saw a genuine sense of um, interest in bringing about the needed uh, improvements and that was something uh, refreshing. Um, our recommendations are really based on uh, the opportunities that we saw to address the challenges that uh, uh, we also observed. Going to the uh, demand side, uh, the second uh, role, one key finding for us was uh, the fact that uh, the one single official composting plant in the city was operating below capacity. Now, mind you, this is a city of over 5 million, I think now 6 million uh, residents. And this, this uh, composting uh, plant's capacity is only 56 tons per day, but it was still operating below capacity. And this brings back the um, point that I made earlier, that we need to look at this as a system, but because the reason why it is operating below capacity is because the supply side isn't working properly. The other key finding that we uh, observed was, um, and I've, we've put this as a challenge, but it can also be considered sort of an opportunity. There is uh, an upcoming, slightly increasing non-traditional uh, player on the demand side. And uh, these are uh, mostly livestock keepers and the zoo there. And uh, we could have, we can't tap into that to make sure that uh, we get uh, better players or rather better and more players on the uh, demand uh, demand side. The only challenge there is there is very poor linkage between the supply side and the demand side. And this takes me to our recommendations on the uh, right, again, on the demand side. Key in using, key being using ICT and innovation to bring about the needed linkage between the supply side and the demand side, and of course, to uh, also tap into this uh, new and non-traditional uh, demand side player and really uh, make a case for um, waste as animal feed. 
Um, going to the uh, last uh, element, uh, the conducive uh, environment, you will agree with me that if you only focus on the supply side and the demand side without looking at the legal and uh, policy framework, you may realize some uh, improvements, but those improvements will not be sustainable. And uh, this, I wouldn't call this uh, really a new uh, finding, but it was something that we uh, really got to uh, sub very substantially uh, uh, support through our um, uh, our study. And uh, uh, my colleague, um, I think uh, he joined later. One of our, uh, our colleagues may speak to uh, may speak to this as well. So um, I will pause there. And uh, we can go into the uh, different aspects of uh, what is being displayed here and aspects that have not uh, really uh, gone into details uh, about during uh, q and I will uh, now welcome my uh, colleague, Annie, to take us through uh, Jesse um, challenges and opportunities. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ms. Eva. Um, hi, everyone. Good to be here. Um, so I will, uh, as said, I'll take us through some of the key uh, gender equality, disability and social inclusion um, challenges and opportunities that we came across on the Dar es Salaam project. Um, I will do it very quickly. Please feel free to follow up with questions um, afterwards. If we could move to the next slide, possibly. So I won't dwell on this for too long. I'll go into a little bit more detail in the next two slides, but just to highlight the key stakeholders that we were primarily um, concerned with and focused on in the programme um, from a GEDSI perspective were women, people with disabilities, young people or youth, older people and waste pickers and informal workers. And of course, to, to state the obvious, these groups overlap um, often on multiple levels. Um, and so they, but they were the kinds of stakeholders that we were finding there were both challenges facing and also huge opportunities um, around. The kinds of issues we were coming across, um, which we found through the secondary research and through our key, key informant interviews, et cetera, were around the health and safety um, of waste pickers and informal workers. The safety and well-being of specific groups, women in particular, and also people with disabilities, um, poor market access um, and facilities, the low status of waste pickers and the, the way they were treated socially around that, um, lack of representation and voice of different groups, and finally limited services in poorer areas in terms of waste collection and processing. Um, they were the immediate challenges. I think it's also worth highlighting that one of the reasons we were so concerned with JETSI in this program is not only because of those immediate challenges, but also recognizing that climate change, pollution, um, natural disasters, et cetera, have a much more, uh, have a much higher and more disproportionate impact on these marginalized groups um, in the longer term as well. So but in both a short-term sense and a long-term sense, this was a, a real priority for the work that we were doing. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of the possible solutions, um, it's worth recognizing that, that um, we have to be realistic within this program. There are lots of very deep seated social norms around hierarchies within society that of course are incredibly important. And we did our best to incorporate those, but we were also looking for kind of quick wins, low hanging fruits, things that we can achieve in the short term uh, in addition to that. Um, for, for the improvement of different stakeholder groups. So a cross-cutting recommendation that we have across all the different activities is whatever happens, it should be done in partnership with organizations for persons with disabilities, women's rights organizations, youth associations, et cetera. There shouldn't be any, any kind of solution identification without involving representatives from the groups that we're, that we're talking about. And that cuts across every single recommendation and area of work. So in terms of health and safety, um, some of the suggestions we made or we're, we're proposing are either free or subsidized or a combination um, of equipment provision and repair, uh, repair being critical, um, recognizing that a lot of the informal workers don't have appropriate PPE, they lack um, kind of adjusted equipment, for example, workers with disabilities, um, women workers who may require different tools, tools for working in flooded um, conditions or very rainy conditions. So having the ability to access those tools would be critical. Um, installing hand washing and sanitation stations in the markets. These do exist in some cases, they don't in others, but making sure that they are kind of accessible and present um, consistently. 
And then we recommended working with relevant stakeholders to address the issue of workers working far longer hours than they are meant to um, by their contracts. Obviously, this isn't an easy to solve issue, but there needs to be some kind of troubleshooting around perhaps the payment of overtime, the hiring of more people, um, more representation or more empowerment of uh, the representative groups for informal workers to be able to lobby more effectively on this issue. So some problem solving around that area. In terms of safety and well-being, as I said, primarily uh, this was referring to women, uh, market users and market workers and informal workers, um, and also people with disabilities who had had reports of receiving abuse, um, uh, kind of verbal and physical, lots of a high proportion of the female market vendors um, in Dar es Salaam have experienced some form of um, physical harassment or abuse. So one of the suggestions was to establish a working group or task force, which would include key um, state and civil society actors to identify the hotspots for where, where um, instances of abuse are happening, what kinds of abuse, what kinds of support people are or are not seeking, um, and what kind of redress there is, what um, processes in place to try and work out exactly what the situation is. Based on that, um, we recommend that there should be an improvement in terms of the communication of reporting mechanisms um, so that people are aware a, where they can report and also so that perpetrators and potential perpetrators are aware that reporting is going to be taking place and that might act as a deterrent. Um, and finally, recognizing that women in particular using, um, but selling particularly at the markets, um, have a huge cost to pay in terms of using the toilets at the markets, and that this actually can often take up half of their profit for a day um, because the toilets are expensive and not well maintained. So some kind of improvement and or subsidizing of market infrastructure for, for women in particular. Next slide, please. In terms of market accessibility, um, of course, any major overhaul of market, market infrastructure should be thinking about accessibility right from the get go. But in the shorter term, we're recommending that there be some kind of a hotspot um, a scan or assessment of markets to recognize where are the key areas where accessibility is a problem, particularly in, in um, times when there's flooding, for example, and to come up with some easy win interventions. So that could be widening a pathway slight, slightly, putting down a ramp, putting in some paving stones, kind of quick, cheap things that can be done to improve market accessibility in the short term. In terms of empowerment and outreach activities, this is recognizing that with any of the activities um, that we're proposing, we need to be we need to be engaging and working in partnership with historically marginalized groups right from the get go, or we're not going to change the, the, the dynamics as they currently are. So there should be targeting a targeted campaign to promote um, the different activities being proposed for different groups. And the example I've given here is around centralized and home composting. There's a lot of evidence from a lot of different contexts that women are often um, some of the first to most successfully take up composting, particularly in the home. It's, a, it's an activity that has a low barrier to entry, a low cost associated with it. So it can be easily kind of adopted by people who might otherwise not have accessibility around these things. Um, there should be targets and outreach around GEDSI informed hiring and training across all activities. So if we're going to be engaging people, um, providing training, hiring for different activities, this is something we need to be thinking about right from the start. And finally, um, the status of waste pickers. This came up again and again in our research that waste pickers and informal workers are seen as um, kind of societally less than um, they're seen as doing dirty work, etc. Um, and there's a lot of stigmatization around the very important work that they do. And so as part of the communication um, around the different activities to improve waste management, we're proposing that there be proactive communication to champion the role of waste pickers um, for general citizens, for market vendors who don't necessarily understand the important role that they're playing, to make that really, to make that their, their role really clear. Um, and finally, um, we are also recommending greater engagement with and support to waste pickers associations. Um, there are informal and formal um, collectives and associations that exist for waste pickers across different markets, um, but some of them are not very active, they're dormant, um, waste pickers themselves don't know that they exist, so trying to kind of create those as actual um, powerful voices in this discussion um, is, is something we would recommend. That was a whistle stop tour, but I will I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Amy. Uh, 
this is this is very important and thanks for presenting both Amy, Amy and Muzaffar. So um, there are a number of takeaways from this. Uh, thanks for sending your introductions and thanks for sending your questions. Uh, please keep sending your questions. Oh, we are aiming to stop at uh, half past or we will give you at least 30 minutes for questions, answers or discussion points. So you can send those in Q&A uh, or we are also keeping an eye on the comments. So we welcome our uh, panelists. Uh, so next part is that we have uh, two panelists, Dr. Veronica Di Bella, who got uh, uh, years of experience in waste management, and Dr. Harrison Koch uh, also joined. I, I understand there were some issues in Nairobi, so some participants may also be finding difficult, but Harrison has joined. So can we go to the next slide? Um, and uh, we have first question to you, uh, Veronica. Uh, you recently worked uh, on this issue, but you also worked on a number of other issues. So based on your recent experience, what would you say about the lessons in large infrastructure provision uh, within this context, which is the fruit and vegetable markets and organic waste and climate change? So uh, over to you, Veronica. Thank you. Thanks, Mansoor, and hello, everyone. Um, so uh, during my my career, during my experience, I've seen quite a few infrastructure projects also in other sectors, more broadly than just on organic ways, from which I think we can all draw uh, some lessons. And especially, I'm going to share two examples which really brought this to life for me. Uh, one was uh, um, an incinerator for healthcare waste, which I saw a few years ago in, uh, in Juba in South Sudan. Uh, this incinerator was clearly brand new, really built with a kind of most modern technologies, but unfortunately he laid there in a corner of the premises of the main hospitals in Juba, um, locked, uh, clearly not being used for a long time, with a lot of healthcare waste just scattered around. Um, so I think like some of the issues that brought these are probably linked to a lack of fuel to start uh, the initial process, or possibly even the cost of fuel the difficulty in retrieving spare parts, and especially like in a context like South Sudan, bringing spare parts in when something breaks down can be very, very challenging. Um, and probably there was also an issue on capacity. Someone might have been trained in how to use this new incinerator, but this didn't cascade down when this person moved on. Another example which I thought was useful to share uh, is something which I saw in Vietnam, uh, which was a waste transfer station, uh, which was built again, like with the best possible design techniques that we are we are aware about. So there was a ramp and the trucks were supposed to go up the ramp and then discharge the waste into some skips underneath. Uh, unfortunately, this is not how this transfer station was used. The, the trucks just arrived and just dumped all the waste, including organic waste, uh, on the ground. This clearly leads to potential like soil contamination, water contamination, but it also led to a lot of complaints from the local communities. Again, what could be the issues uh, leading to these? So first of all, some of the trucks were probably not tipping trucks or not equipped for tipping the waste directly. Um, in addition, probably there wasn't enough incentives or control on the drivers to make sure that the transfer station were used properly. And also, they were probably not actually consulted when the transfer station was built. So I think there are quite a few low hanging fruits that we can identify through, through these examples, and they are highly applicable also to organic waste and fruit and vegetable. Um, first of all, consultation of users and key stakeholders is key, and as Amy also highlighted, including also the vulnerable people are part of this consultation is absolutely key. Um, making sure that the design is appropriate to the context, and this means this ranges from the availability of spare parts to considering local uses and incentives as well. Um, and then there is a point about capacity. I think we have all seen that people get trained and then move to different roles. So can we think about innovative ways 
to ensure that capacity is actually transferred, but also thinking whether we can make someone higher up in organizations responsible for, being, for this transfer. Um, and I think going back to what also Muzaffar was saying, I think in, for composting plants, there are also a couple of additional factors which are around the availability and quality of feedstock and also the uh, market for products. I will stop there, but looking forward to continuing the discussion. Thanks, thanks, Veronica. Uh, really, really important points. Uh, operation maintenance and capacity, and think very carefully. So we have uh, uh, one more question uh, to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Harrison Koach. Uh, hope you can hear me, and hope you have joined. So Harrison, you worked in number of African countries and in number of areas. So we would like to ask you that based on your experience, extensive experience in Africa, what would you say about the policies and their effectiveness within this context of organic waste and food waste? Over to you, Harrison. Thank you. Uh, Mansoor, I think uh, there is something to do with Harrison's power and he seems oh, okay. to have dropped off. Oh, no, I can see he's joined in now. Oh, Sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, otherwise we can hand over to uh, another panelist. Yeah. Harrison, can you hear us, please? Can you, can you get the question? Uh, I think he's still joining in, Mansoor. Do you do you okay, think that okay. someone else could answer this and we can come back to Harrison for another uh, question? I mean, we, we have a number of discussions on, on this issue during our, um, our project. And before that, so I'm sure Olopasi and or, and or Muzaffar can answer. So Olopasi, do, would you like to say a few things on this based on our discussions within the project? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Muzaffar and um, Mansour. Um, I think uh, just just to add to what everyone has said, um, there are quite a number of things that can be done in organic waste management. Um, a number of things have been identified, but I think policy play policy um, plays a key in whether these things happen or whether whether they eventually succeed. Right, and um, from my experience, we we identified key roles that policies uh, can play in that in that context. Right, um, I'll cite an example um, of what we saw in a place like Lagos, where 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 I am based. Right, we've got um, uh, an experience. I think in about three, about four or five years ago, where the government had. Um, change the policy that had been intro introduced maybe like 10, 15 years ago and seemed to be working, you know, and the suddenly the government thought something else could work in terms of bringing in private sector and bringing really lovely, you know, approach to that. But in the process of doing that, consultation was limited, right? And that um, ended up, you know, uh, undermining the, 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 the success of the, of the policies. There are quite a number of things that could be that will require policy for people to adopt, right? Into the thing, the sort of changes, the recommendations that we saw and that we developed in the course of implementing the project in Dar es Salaam. It quite, quite a number of them require policy uh, for people to adopt them. But also doing this requires um, both a, a, a requires an extensive approach, a, um, a situation where the policy environment is built right from what is required, you know, surrounded by or supported by extensive um, stakeholder uh, engagement. One of the things that we we saw coming up and we we leveraged very well in the course of our implementation is that sort of things. We had extensive stakeholder engagement both within the market and also amongst the policymakers. And what that does is that um, when the policy is eventually developed, developed as a result of that, we built enough structure, a solid structure for the adoption of the policies, right? And I think that's the angle from which I want to speak to it. Policies are good and policies are important, but they need to be, um, there needs to be extensive stakeholder engagement that gets the buy-in of the people that are expected to, to you know, adopt the policies. Again, quite a number of things would need to be done um, for people to adopt the sort of policies that will require 
them to adopt for this practice. Often, um, the changes that the recommendations that we expect people to take in waste management, especially in organic waste management, requires the government to, you know, say, this is how you should do it. This is how you were doing it before. They require some level of attitudinal changes and all that, right? And that's where our policies have to be, be done from, from, a, from uh, based on extensive stakeholder engagement, which is which was our experience from, from Dar es Salaam. I think Arsene is here now, I'll probably, um, perhaps he, he, he can take this down. Thank, Thank you. you much. Thank you, Olofosi. Um, thanks very much. Um, much elaborated answer. And Harrison, uh, are you are you joined now? Do you want to say anything? You do want yes. to say anything on this? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yes. Th th thank you very much. And sorry for all this. We are experiencing a lot of uh, intermittency in internet connection in Nairobi. And this is really coming in now, especially when I was just about to join the meeting. Uh, well, as has been said, Olifosi has put it so well, uh, policy processing is uh, participatory and we must be inclusive. And in an event it is done with others not in it, it will be very difficult to have a buy-in. When we are talking of vegetable and fruits markets, these are the markets and the major sources of organic waste in every other country in Africa and of course other countries in the world. And uh, studies that have been done in Nairobi shows that a lot of organic waste actually are at the market level because 40% of food losses happens at the market uh, before the consumer. So it means that this a, a organic waste to be addressed, a lot of focus has to be at the market level. Because in any case, even those that are collected, uh, they end up 90% in the dump sites, contributing to all the climate change related emissions. Uh, there are a number of experiences that I might want to share, but I'll only perhaps take one or two because of the time. Uh, one is that uh, my experience in West Africa, especially Sierra Leone, where I worked and uh, was trying to address issues to do with with, with management properly. Uh, one thing that came out clearly is that uh, there's uh, a disconnect. A disconnect in the sense that policy is here, but policy operationalization fails in the sense that uh, those who are meant to do the uh, policy uh, over, uh, oversight are, are the same people who are, are uh, given the responsibility to handle waste management. So you are a department of waste of, of environment or public health. You are responsible for doing waste collection services, but you are also responsible for maintaining stand standards. In an event, there is any a failure. Who is going to police who? And uh, who is going to ensure standards are met? So my experience in West Africa is that uh, what I did is to uh, address that by uh, reforming the structure of the municipalities, that you delink waste management as an operational arm of the municipality, but allow the uh, Department of Environment and the public health to do their policing work. That having been said, yes, it's a good thing to do. But then my experience in Kenya is again here is that the policing arm in Kenya is uh, the, uh, the, the environmental, uh, National Environmental Authority. But uh, the service provider is the county government and all of them are government entities. So in an event, one government entity fails, another one wants to take a government entity to court. So the government cannot take government to court. So then that is also another handicap in policy application. And therefore the sufferers end up being, of course, the market traders. Finally, in my experience in Zanzibar, where, of course, it's also elsewhere, but who is in charge of the market? within the municipality. It's a market department. But who is in charge of waste management services? 
it's in the environment and or, 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 or public health. Uh, who collects money uh, that is meant to offer services in the market is the market services, market traders, uh, I mean, market management authority. But then where is this money going? Is it plowed back to, sub to support the, uh, the waste collection services? Not at all. So then how can the waste management services improve the infrastructure, even though the policy requires that there should be a source separation uh, at so, uh, I mean, of, of waste even at the market level, so they end up having something, some some rudimentary places where waste is taken, either skip, or uh, other sub cubicles or other sub open field that will be collected laboriously, or will be collected through any mechanized system. But there's no provision for waste separation. So if you want your organic waste to go to other places. Demand could be there from animal farmers that they are going to use this to feed their stock, but the waste is already contaminated. Finally, an experience in Nairobi uh, that has proven that is something that can work is that there is one company called Sanaji. This company is uh, collecting waste from the markets, but also sub subsidizing or uh, investing in, in infrastructure to allow for source separation of waste and also to motivate uh, the bucket traders to put their waste in a manner that they will be collected. So, so there are several initiatives that can, that can come. But the catchy thing here is that the gap between the policy application, uh, 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 policy operationalization and uh, the policy oversights is so uh, glaring, and until that one is corrected, it is not going to be easy because market traders are working on their own. There could be some associations of the market traders, but they are all, all, all based on their interests and not driven by a certain policy principle that they should be here as a tool that can be used to uh, streamline things and operations of issues to do with waste management. I think I, I will I will end it there for now. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Harrison. And rightly, another important takeaway is about these interfaces. We, we often forget about these interfaces. So policy is not policy only, but what you said about the government to government relationship, intergovernmental issues and all that. Very key. So please keep sending your questions. We already have received some questions. Uh, I on the system I I can't assign, so I can I can ask uh, participants, panelists, and speakers to answer some of these questions. So there is one question uh, from Ajaz uh, on the government interest in compost uh, that I will be asking Muzaffar to reply. Uh, the, keeping in mind the situation in in Dar, what is the government interest in compost and they are they ready to scale it up? So that's one question there. Uh, the other comment, there are two comments, one on Jet C and the other on the recording. So recordings and slides are available, will be available. I think Shweta already uh, answered that question. So then the fourth, uh, fourth question is on the type of waste, uh, fibrous waste uh, is from Hebron and what we do about the waste which we cannot compost. Uh, me or uh, Harrison or Veronica can they take that question. And then there is one question on the business model for compost plant. I I, I suggest one of us, like I probably Muzaffar can answer that. And what happens to the waste which is not composted? So again, a number of these questions are uh, on few people. So I suggest Muzaffar take it as a discussion and be brief so we can take more questions. So first question I will assign to you, what is the government interest in, in composting in that and uh, what, how it can be scaled up? Over to you. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mansoor. So um, yeah, I'm looking at the question here. Why don't governments and low-income countries pay attention to uh, organizing compost, correct? Yeah, all right. So um, one, I would say that um, governments don't really pay attention. A good example in that, for example, the uh, one composting plant that, that you mentioned, 
is actually the result of a collaboration between uh, Kinondora Municipal and a uh, private sector uh, company. And uh, that comes from, uh, of course, a realization that uh, uh, that kind of facility is actually needed. Uh, but uh, does that uh, realization uh, then result into 100% uh, success? The answer is no. There is, of course, challenges. And uh, among the challenges is uh, uh, the issue of uh, capacity, and Veronica has touched on that already, uh, issue of resources. Um, uh, Harrison has uh, sort of touched on that already, and of course, Veronica again. So um, I think there is uh, already some level of uh, appetite in these uh, technologies. Uh, but um, that doesn't, uh, it's not a silver bullet. Sim simple, simply having a, an appetite is not a silver bullet. There are challenges that need to be uh, dealt with and uh, solutions to those uh, may take longer than uh, usually anticipated. Thank you. And now we also have a new question on the success stories uh, beyond Nairobi. So I will divert that to, to Veronica while I will try to answer that question about the non-compostable waste. So and I, anybody can add as well. So yes, the, it, it's a very important point because we always believe that all the organic we are going waste, 60, 70% is compostable. We can treat it, we, it's a resource. And it took us a bit of time to explain that point across different stakeholders. Uh, even within the market waste, all the waste is not readily compostable. And there are fibrous waste and all that. What's happening in Dar, they develop five or six streams of conversion, which is very interesting, including one of them is the oil conversion uh, from the fibrous waste. So understanding those streams and, and making use and divert it to different places is important. Compost is also a not, not a total solution. You still have rejects and waste which requires landfilling. So that's a short answer that that also takes us to the another question, which is uh, about what happens to the waste which is not recycled or composted. Um, Harrison, do you want to answer that question? Um, if waste is not recycled or composted, what happens to that? Thanks. Well, that's that's a very good one, and that is the reason why the this issue of source segregation is very important that uh, we put waste uh, to various categories to allow for uh, uh, various technologies that could apply. And talking on uh, organic waste, for example, you are talking of, uh, you, you are likely to get even such waste like uh, uh, a coconut shell, which obviously, if, if, even if you put it through composting, it won't come back. But uh, there are other technologies, low cost, like briquetting. You can uh, put such kind of waste into uh, the, uh, the biochar and then make them into briquettes and still uh, let them go back to replace the charcoal that, uh, that does the deforestation of the forests and uh, still provide the needed cooking material from them. Uh, their waste management principle is a broad kind of uh, area that requires innovation and low-cost technologies. So other waste that cannot be uh, uh, put through process, uh, composting process, uh, there, there should be other ways of uh, handling them. When we are talking of market waste, we are, of course, not really talking of only organic waste. Other waste materials will also be there. So the uh, recycling principle that applies to other waste uh, materials when properly separated should apply. And the technologies are out there. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. So there are three, three more questions. Uh, which I will divert to uh, Amy, but be, uh, we will hear to Veronica first. So Amy, for you, uh, the questions after Veronica will be on uh, community management uh, options for low scale composting, positive examples of behavior change and jet C. We did a bit of review, we came across some, but uh, you can share a couple. So Veronica, the, the, the question was, uh, uh, to you was the positive example on composting, which you came across beyond Nairobi. Do you do you recall anything? Do you want to share something with the participants? Thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mansoor. So I think uh, in addition to 
Synergy, which has already been mentioned. Uh, I think like there are quite a few good examples, both of composting plants managed like a government level, especially like in seen some like South Asian and Southeast Asian countries, like Bangladesh is doing, for example, very, very well on composting. Uh, similarly, like in India, there are quite a few composting plants. Um, and I think in both of these cases, again, it's important to highlight that this is also linked to uh, more and more strict legislation on uh, organic waste separation and uh, uh, on composting. Um, I think there are also quite a few examples more like at company level. So there are a number of, for example, agribusinesses that have uh, successfully implemented like small composting plants um, or uh, even anaerobic digestion. Uh, and finally, there are quite also quite a a few good examples also a community scale of community scale composting again i'm more familiar with the ones in uh, south asia and southeast asia but this is a model can, can also be successfully implemented thanks uh, amy to you regarding behavior change community management and jet c positive examples thanks thank you sorry i'm struggling to see which question that is but in terms of um I saw there was one, and perhaps this is what you mean, Mansoor, I'm relating to um, how to kind of, yeah, engage engage people um, I, I in terms of... Or as Shalini's questions. From Shalini, yes, exactly. That's what I'm looking at. Yeah. yeah. So I think why well, I think the first, the first point, um, and I would say this is a kind of key success factor across lots of examples, is the point I made right at the start of the presentation, which is around working with groups that are representative of marginalized groups. So whether it's organizations for persons with disabilities, women's rights groups, um, female collectives for waste pickers. Um, there's a couple of different examples in India where um, waste pickers collectives have played a key role in terms of engaging women, um, not, not necessarily in composting, but in terms of becoming key actors in, in the development of waste processing. Um, I think those kinds of groups who are representing different marginalized groups are the ones who will have the answers in terms of what kind of communication methods are going to be most effective, the the way that training, for example, and, and outreach could be best delivered, be that in a very practical sense in terms of what time is training held, what what different you know languages or dialects, et cetera, but also in terms of, yeah, thinking about the power dynamics of who should be delivering what kinds of messages to whom um, in different settings. I think there's also a point there around recognizing the difference, the different kind of interests and strengths of different groups. So for example, when we were looking into the options for the the Dar es Salaam project, recognizing that um, young people um, are kind of on the one hand historically marginalized from from decision making processes, but on the other hand, are um, you know much more tech engaged and tech savvy um, than perhaps their older counterparts. And is there a role for them in terms of the digital um, and kind of app based promotion of different? Um, waste management techniques and, and communication methods. Can youth groups actually be involved in promoting that both because they might be best placed to do it and also because it's a means of empowering them as well as active participants in the process? Yeah, thank you, Amy. And then we have a couple of questions from, from Naveed Rahman. So one is uh, about the compost uh, business modeling. So in Dar es Salaam, World Bank is currently doing an exercise to do a business modeling of compost um, perhaps i will i will ask uh, one of you perhaps ola posi to to say a few things on that later on on the business modeling how would you do that but in gadar the business model at the moment it's, it's working but there may be some hidden subsidies and support and then there is a direct question about the funding for informal sector integration in pakistan so public or private so yes uh, i mean the answer is is no, but what I could say that in Pakistan, they benefited uh, more in two ways. So one of them is the community-based uh, groups in uh, slum areas who are benefiting informal sector collectors and engaging them well. So for example, in Karachi, there are, we estimated there are um, uh, roughly half a million doing waste collection and recycling uh, and providing a service delivery to 60% of the household. So it's a very big number. There and then the other model I came across in Lahore is the this this company, um, which is doing uh, integrating waste uh, pickers uh, into their uh, proper plastic recycling business. So it's a private company, but they set up the value chain 
through through waste pickers and it seemed like a successful model but i have only read about it so these are the two uh, things from your side uh, to your question navid on the business modeling points uh, olapasi or muzaffar do you want to say something on the business model of the com large compost plant in dar i think so yeah okay um, i think uh, yeah, that's I okay to, yeah all right i try to uh, respond to this as simply as uh, humanly possible so looking at the um, composting facility in the rest and the current one in Mabu um one could uh, very easily say uh, you look at it uh, the way that you you would look at uh, uh, any other uh, business where you have your inputs you have the operation and then you have the outputs and you try to as much as possible, make sure that uh, the cost of selling your outputs far exceeds the cost of the inputs and the operation, yeah? But that is the ideal situation. Things don't always work like that, yeah? Uh, you would, for example, uh, I mean, especially in uh, low-income countries, find that uh, the cost of inputs, transportation from markets all the way to the facility, the operation, far exceeds the uh, uh, products that uh, come out, uh, out of this uh, facility. And that's the case in the restaurant, by the way. And uh, um, what uh, what that then leads to is uh, a lot of uh, subsidization. Uh, the uh, current facility, for example, uh, is uh, supported by uh, the municipal, and uh, there is uh, some cost sharing at play there that um, sort of allows the uh, uh, facility to sustain itself. But in addition to that, they have also been a little bit uh, creative, and uh, they do not have only one product line. They've come up with multiple product lines. Uh, they have uh, uh, animal feed, for example. I see one of the participants has mentioned uh, black soja fly here technology, and that's one of the technologies uh, that uh, they use. And uh, the um, output of that uh, uh, process, they end up selling that, and that is actually more profitable than uh, the composting uh, process, and it kind of uh, subsidize the other product line and keeps uh, the lights on. So uh, I wouldn't say there is a uh, one simple uh, business model. It varies from country to country, situation to situation, and uh, really depends on uh, uh, the kinds of a uh, partnership that uh, are in place. Really. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mustafa. Anything from anybody else? Olafasi, do you want to add anything on this point? Y yes, I, I think the point I want to ask the other part of the question is whether it's whether someone is. Um, running a model profitably. And I can say that, whilst I can't say whether somebody is running it profitably or not, what we can say from my experience, um, um, the, the, the one that Muzaffar um, um, just alluded to is the fact that, yeah, it's the model is, is, is your usual business model, try to make sure that your cost doesn't, uh, your cost is below your, your, the revenue that you're making and then you can have a spread there, right? But even in the context of the different challenges that vary, in, 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 given the different challenges that you would see, um, which varies from context to context, right? Um, there is still, um, given the fact that it's been established, the demand for the product has been established. Of course, it varies from level. Um, levels vary from one context or from one market to another market. There is good opportunity to serve to serve the market profitably. You would. Given that it's all it, the product that we're talking about is not necessarily like it, many of the other products that are already established in terms of how they are offered into the market, you would initially have different sitting stage issues that you would need to address, right? Um, Mazafar spoke to how the the, the person Dar Salam the some of sort, sort of the, the sort of things that he's tried to do they've tried to do to be able to address those issues, but you would. Um, have those sort of issues that might be different. You would have them to deal with, but when they're properly taken care of, there is opportunity for profit. Uh, that's just what I want to add to that. Yeah, good. Thank you. And thanks, Azgar um, Pevani, for answering that point about the aeration from the fibrous contents. That's a very good point. Thanks for adding that. There's one more question about the leachate from the compost plants and the banning of the food waste. So food waste is, uh, as far as I know, is not used in Dar es Salaam for composting is uh, vegetable, uh, fresh vegetable, green waste. But Bevani can, can correct us. And also if you can type your answer about the, uh, the leachate from the compost plant, the compost plant in Dar is covered. Um, so the, the leachate quantities may be reduced already, but again, 
there may be some additions you can you can make uh, thanks very much so we are reaching the end of the webinar uh, any final points um, from i think there's one more qu question on from nolene on profitability and social impact uh, uh, neg negatively affected by lack of clear and post gun policies and regulations so we covered that partly um, but it's a, it's again it's a it's a good point because what what we are trying to do in this project and overall in the program is to take a more holistic and ecosystem approach to some of these problems so it's it's a challenge but uh, the way number of powerful stakeholders work they see things in isolation and what we are trying to do is to build up a picture so that's why social development component is very important important the viability sustainability aspects are very important and and that is um, i mean in dar these government support in my opinion is reasonable reasonably good as compared to many other countries i worked um, so so th there is th the support is there but again more awareness and more capacity is required um, and we are not only the leaders to do that it's a, it's a joint effort most of the time so we have 2 3 minutes left any final points from anybody in the panel and speakers the only thing that I can say is that uh, just to re-emphasize what I've said before, that uh, for a sustainable market and vegetable waste uh, to be addressed, uh, you need to do two, three things. One, if there is a way to create demand for the organic waste from the market, and this is by building secular economy model around the youth groups and other businesses. So can you create a business model? And then when business model comes in, then it will propel and force the uh, policy related issues to even come along. So you can work the other way around. Policy would come first if it was the best intention to do, but policy can also be triggered to come in because this demand that is created here to make it happen. So business model and allowing uh, businesses to thrive. This not only on youth groups and uh, or, or other com community-based groups, but even uh, embracing the involvement of private sector to invest. Like in the case of Sanaji in Nairobi, that has invested into that process and making demand for organic waste. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to our speakers. Uh, thanks to our panelists. Uh, there are a number of resources available. We are also trying to publish our report, but there is a recent blog and we are hoping to share the summary. There's also there's also translation done for the executive summary um, in Swahili language, which is available also. So we are trying to disseminate as much as possible as we can and also connect through LinkedIn, connect through community of practice with the Engineering Academy, Engineering X program. Um, and hopefully we will have more fruitful discussions uh, and learning. So thanks to Be Wastewise and thanks to all. Thank you, Mansoor. Thanks a lot to uh, all the speakers. We had a great panel today and we had a significant number of attendees as well and uh, very busy, several questions coming your way and uh, when I mean, I will share more resources and you know, details of the report once Mansoor shares them with Be Waste Wise. And this particular webinar will anyway go up on our website in two weeks. So if you want to be alerted to it, please sign up to our newsletter. Thanks a lot to the panel. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.